Hello, hello, CQDX. Oh, CQ stateside too. I am Rhea. My call sign is N2RJ, and welcome to Rhea Shack, the radio show that puts you in touch with ham radio and other types of radio that you will enjoy. Right here on WTWW Shortwave, 7 p.m. Central on Saturdays, 8 p.m. Eastern, and also midnight UTC. I guess that's Sunday. And we'd like to thank the fine folks at WTWW Shortwave for making this possible. They run this really fine radio station, the big one, 5085, broadcasting out of Lebanon, Tennessee. If you'd like to check them out and also support the station, you can go on to WTWW.us and you can, um, you know, see ways to support them. You can also listen live on their live stream I know some people, they don't always have access to shortwave um, uh, radio. And if you want to tell people about the show, you know, tell them about the multiple ways to listen. I also run a YouTube channel, which is Rhea Shack Ham Radio. And you can check that out on YouTube. Just look for Rhea's Shack Ham Radio. That's R-I-A, Rhea Shack Ham Radio. And we talk about new and upcoming things in ham radio. A lot of old things too. History, news, views how to's and generally how to make the most out of amateur radio from a unique and different perspective because you know I'm a unique individual as we all are and we should always be you know looking to seek diverse viewpoints on things so what are we going to talk about this week well I have a good few news items including a story of a rescue a story about the RSGB making awards to the ARRL RF safety committee um, convention and also um, new uh, people want, who want to be hired at the RSGB and AWRL, um, and, and we'll talk a little, little bit about enforcement. We have some questions about technicians and their privileges, um, GMRS licensing, believe it or not, uh, you know, old TV antennas used for ham radio, and also why you can't make local contacts on 80 meters. So that's um, that's really good. We're also going to be talking about Dayton Hamvention. You know, it's two weeks from Dayton, and I'm going to be at Dayton Hamvention. It's been a long two years, I could tell you. I always have fun at the Dayton Hamvention, even when they moved from Trotwood to Xenia, you know, um, the old Hara Arena. I've been going there not too long, since about 2006, and I actually bought a mobile station that got me into HF at Dayton. And, you know, I always have a good time, the friends, the fun, and uh, all the, you know, just the show, you know. It's been a really, really um, monumental event for ham radio, so I'm glad to see it coming back. I'll be hanging out um, with the AWRL, of course, but also, you know, look to hang out a little bit with Ted and Holly at WTWW. And also, um, I'm going to be around at several after-hours events. I'm going to talk about a couple people who are coming to Dayton. Uh, One of them you might want to meet, especially if you're, um, you know, you're supporting our friends in Ukraine. And speaking about our friends in Ukraine, I want to give a support and encouragement to our friends in Ukraine that, you know, we love you. We, um, we always support you and we hope that you, you eventually will see the peace that you so rightfully deserve and that you will come out stronger a much stronger um, Ukraine. You know, it always, um, always, you know, I always like to see the pictures of these videos of these farmers pulling the Russian tanks away from Vladimir Putin. It's funny. It's just funny. You know, I always admire the farmers, what they do. But um, that's good. So if you're listening on shortwave from Ukraine, um, you know, God bless you. And I hope you, you know, you, you could, we could talk on the radio for real. Um, If you have questions, send them to Rhea at n2rj.com and I'll answer them. All right, we take a break and then we'll come right back. So I want to tell you a little bit about what I do on YouTube. So I started my YouTube channel actually streaming live radio of what I did with the 13 Colonies special event and also other things. My friend Eric N2KOJ, he had some, uh, you know, some uh, operation remotely on my station. So why don't you check us out at... Ria's Shack Ham Radio on YouTube. That's Ria's Shack Ham Radio on YouTube. And while while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe.
Okay, so let's talk about the news. So in the news, uh, the first item of news is a radio ham who helped save a man who was swept overboard. So I found this kind of interesting because this person didn't exactly use amateur radio. But, you know, as we'll, we'll discover in the story, what, how it happened and, um, you know, what the ham spirit does. So this is from Southgate Amateur Radio News. Radio ham helps save man swept overboard. It says on Thursday night, April 28, UTC, an emergency call came in that a ship had a man overboard. A Norwegian radio amateur helped to save the person in question. So they have a translation of the story from NRRL, which is the Norwegian National Society. In addition to being an avid radio amateur, Ger Tor Christiansen, I hope I pronounced his name right, L-A-5-Z-O, L-A-5-Z-O, is also an avid sailor. He is currently in port in Horta on the island of Fayal in the Azores with the sailboat Ocean Viking. Thursday night at 2341 UTC, he received an emergency call on digital selective call DSC at 12 megahertz. The call came from the Hong Kong registered bulk carrier MV Shandong Fujin, who is on his way from New Orleans with a course for the Panama Canal. They reported a person overboard and stated their position at 27.39 north and 88.49 east. Now, the next part, I'll tell you, used to always trip me up, okay, when I was doing geography. Uh, but, um, you know, I did figure it out. Ger Torre describes it like this on Facebook. I felt some association to LA8 PV flexness. Uh, and My Mayday, a fictional amateur radio, radio amateur in the TV show Radiot, when I received an emergency call on digital selective call at 12 megahertz on Friday night. For fun, I put the position on the map and found that it must be wrong. The position was far inland in Bangladesh. I had the boat's MMSI number and searched for it in marine traffic. There was the right position, i.e. that 88 East should be west, and he was then... 100 nautical miles south of New Orleans. I found the phone number of the U.S. Coast Guard who has this area. They had not received any DSC and thanked for the info and said it would call them on a satellite phone. Yesterday, Gear Tour could read online that a search operation had been launched by, and he had been found by a plane with a heat-seeking camera and then rescued by helicopter. The person in question was wearing an inflatable work vest case ended well. One man's curiosity became another man's salvation. And and this is what I say, you know, um, stay curious, my friends, because, you know, you never know you might save a life. And hams are very famous for staying curious, especially with radio signals. You know, even though this was not amateur radio and, you know, not not every success story involves amateur radio. This is just something, you know, that we have to realize, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I, I can't believe I'm saying that. But this person was helped because of the curious ham spirit. That's amazing. And I really hope that he can continue, you know, saving more lives. But I hope more people don't get swept overboard. Uh, particularly at sea, you know, it's really interesting. They use HF radio extensively. So the other story in the nude, news, <laughs> not nude, the news is the RSGB Awards, RF Safety. Um, they're going to award something to the members of the ARRL RF Safety Committee. So, ARRL, this is from the ARRL. ARRL RF Safety Committees, Committee members to be honored by the Radio Society of Great Britain. The chairman of the ARRL RF Safety Committee. RFSC, Greg D. Lappin, N9GL, PhD, professional engineer, will receive an award at the 2022 Dayton Hamvention from the Radio Society of Great Britain. He will receive the Founders Trophy, recognizing his outstanding service to the society. He will also be accepting awards for committee members Kai Siriak, KE4PT, I believe Kai was the, um, the editor of NCJ, Rick Tell, K5UJU, not NCJ, sorry, QEX. He, why would he be NCJ? Uh, Rick Tell, K5UJU, and Matt Butcher, KC3WD. 
Along with members of the RSGB, the ARRL RF Safety Committee members formed an EMF oversight group, which has been meeting since August 2020 to help develop tools and procedures for complying with the new RF exposure regulations for amateur radio operators in Great Britain. The new rules in the UK are similar to those already in effect in the United States. The new rules will be phased in over a two-year period and are currently in effect for high band frequencies only. RSGB members of the EMF Oversight Group are John Rogers, M0JAV, RSGB Director, Peter Zolman, G4DSE, and Ian White, GM3SEK, who received their awards at the Society's Annual General Meeting on April 23rd, 2022, during an online ceremony. All right, so um, this is interesting because, you know, the RF safety topic has been all over, and um, it really took a lot of work on behalf of the ARRL by, um, you know, Greg, um, N9GL, and the rest of them, to basically get everything, you know, together. And uh, I guess they work with the FCC as well to get everything together for these new RF exposure regulations. And you'll see this is an area that's constantly evolving because, you know, the more we learn about what RF does and such like that, the more, you know, we'll have these regulations. At the same time, not much has really changed. As I say in the videos, in my video, not much has really changed in terms of these regulations. So if you want to check out the video that I made, you could look at, for it on the Ria Shack YouTube channel or look for RF safety and you can see it there. So kudos to Greg and the rest of them. The RSGB itself is going to be holding their convention in 2022. And um, let's see here. So yeah, the RSGB... We'll be having a convention on 7th and 9th October at Kent's Hill Park Training and Conference, Milton Keynes. They'll be looking forward to meeting again. And booking is now open on the RSGB website. They have early booking discounts. It's really good. I don't know. Should I go or should I not? <laughs> it would be interesting. I always want to go to Friedrichshafen, but I've never had the, the time, you know, to do it. Maybe I'll, I'll figure out something. Um, things might change around here, and I might be able to, to go. So, um, very good, but it's good. They've been on hiatus due to COVID for the past couple of years, so it's always good to see conventions coming back. Hopefully, you know, the new variants kind of keep down a little bit, and we're not doing that. So, The RSGB is also looking for a new tech editor, right? They are not. They're also looking for a new managing editor, a new technical editor. So, RSGB are continuing their search for new Radcom, that's their magazine, editorial team members, the managing editor role, advertised by Redwood Publishing Recruitment, has appeared in The Guardian and LinkedIn. Two positions available are managing editor and technical editor, pay for both and described as generous. Redwood Safe, Flexible and Hybrid Working is available for the managing editor role. It might suit someone who has experience of working for a technical and or membership journal or magazine with an interest in electronics, computing, engineering, or other technical experience. The technical editor role is based at RSGP headquarters near Bedford, although an element of working from home could be discussed. Experience in proofreading is advantageous, but not essential. So they have the, um, the details of both ro roles are on rsgp.org forward slash careers. Now that's good. You know, the ARRL also recently hired a new news editor as well. I think it's important for radio societies in general to, um, to have a proper news department because people depend on them. And finally, the ARRL is going to have a guest from the FCC to talk about enforcement, and uh, that's going to be real interesting. Uh, Lark Hadley, KA4A. So if you're at Dayton Hamvention, he will take part in a ARRL-sponsored forum on Saturday. The forum, Good Operators and the ARRL Volunteer Monitoring Program, We'll feature Riley Hollingsworth. So looking forward to that. And we'll talk a little bit about more of that with Dayton. All right. So we'll take a break and we'll come right back. So instead of commercials, I'm going to go through some of the questions in the technician exam. I'll feature one or two every week. So T1A01 in the current technician pool ending in June uh, 2022. Which of the following is the purpose of the amateur radio service as stated in the FCC rules and regulations? A, providing personal radio communications for as many citizens as possible. B, 
providing communications for international nonprofit organizations, C, advancing skills in the technical and communication phases of the radio art. D, all these choices are correct. Well, A is definitely not correct because you're not, the job is not, the purpose of amateur radio is not to provide radio communications for as many citizens as possible. B, providing communications for international nonprofit organizations. Mm, not really. Uh, we might do that sometime, but it's not a basis on purpose. What about C, advancing skills in the technical and communication phases of the radio art? Yeah, that is actually stated in the basis and purpose. So the answer is C, advancing skills in the technical and communication phases of the radio art. That, my friends, is one of the purposes of the amateur radio service. Now, back to the show. So this is always my favorite segment, the Q&A, because this is where I get to help people and educate them in the world of amateur radio, and especially technicians. We got one or two questions that could pertain to technicians. The first one is, what bands can technicians use for DX? And today we're going to talk about one of them. One of them is a six meter band. So the six meter band actually opens up really nice in the Northern Hemisphere between, let's say, about April, May till about September. Uh, and then you have a small opening in January around there, December, January. And then you can work lots of DX when the E skip is high. I mean, there's also some, you know, ionospheric F2 propagation. So if, you, if you're new to the hobby, basically, you learn that the ionosphere is the layer of the Earth's atmosphere that reflects or refracts radio waves and causes, bends them downward for them to travel further distances. You know, just like how a satellite will take a signal and retransmit it, but this is passive, right? This is nature doing this for us, right? So we have natural propagation. And there are several layers. There's the F layer and there's the E layer, and the E layer will activate sporadically during the warmer summer months in, um, in both hemispheres. So I was actually, I was, if you look on my channel, you'll see there is a whole live stream I did with Hayden, VK7HH, talking about the six meter band. And it was really interesting because I got his perspective from the Southern hemisphere. And I got, um, you know, my perspective from the Northern hemisphere. It was a really, really nice discussion and complete overall view of amateur radio six meter propagation. So check that out. The other bands you can use, believe it or not, you can use 10 meters voice, right? From 28.3 to 28.5. You can use 10 meters data, right? There's a data segment, I believe it's from 28 to 28.3. There's the FT8 segment, you can use that as well. 10 meter band. Um, unfortunately, you cannot use any other voice modes besides single sideband SSB. You can, um, you can also use 40, 80, and 15 meters on Morse code only. You know, this is kind of like a leftover from the novice license, but you have the same frequency privileges as a general class licensee. So it starts from like 25 kilohertz above the lower band edge, and then going up, you know, possibly all the way, most of the band for CW Morse code. And Morse code is actually fun. If you're looking for a fun way to practice Morse code, you can try Morsel. M-O-R-S-L-E dot fun. You know, it's just like Wordle, okay? You know Wordle from the New York Times? Well, it was bought by the New York Times. It's a daily word game you can actually play, um, and, uh, you you know, you try to guess a word. Well, this one sends a word over Morse code, and you get to, to try it. So try it. Try it. It's fun. The next question is, why would I want a GMRS license when I have a ham license? So for those of you who don't know what GMRS is, GMRS is the general mobile radio service in the United States. It is the, the, basically it's UHF CB, you know, kind of, you know, in Europe they have PMR 446 as well, which is kind of similar, I believe. Um, but this one, this one kind of gives you a good bit of power, I believe up to 50 watts, and you can also um, use repeaters too. So why would you want this? Well, Let's say you have family members who are not into ham radio and they, you know you want to talk with them off the grid or you want to talk with them um, you know at the mall at the mall 
in New Jersey, <laughs> right? Not that big new American dream wall. Oh my, that thing is humongous and waste of time. Anyway, but um, yeah, let's say you go to the mall and you, you want to talk to people. You want to talk to each other, keep your family members in touch. Well, you could get these little GMRS radios, but you didn't know that you need a license. The good news is that the FCC has dropped the license fee to $35 for that. So you get $35. But wait, there is more. Oh, yes. The $35 license covers your entire family. And it's not just your immediate family. It covers like your brothers and sisters. It covers your grandkids, parents. Oh, my gosh. It covers a lot of, you know, people. So it's like a whole family radio thing. $35 can't be beat. You know, I would say everybody, you know, who wants to have that in their emergency toolkit, get a GMRS license. I actually talked about the process in a video on the on the channel. You can check it out um, uh, that says um, why I got a GMRS license, why you should get one too. I actually have a new um, GMRS radio I'm testing out from uh, Redivis. And Redivis has been a big supporter of the channel too. So, you know, you look out for that. Um, it's a spoiler alert. It's one that I install in my car. Mm, okay. Speaking about that, um, recommendations for a mobile radio. So if you are looking for a mobile radio, we're talking about VHF, UHF. I would definitely recommend one that has at least, that has, not at least, that has 50 watts on VHF. Okay. The reason being that you definitely will not miss that extra power. You know, sorry, you will definitely miss that extra power if you go somewhere far away from repeater coverage and it combats things like where you're, um, you know, you're behind um, hills and such like that. So I really recommend one of that. I don't recommend anything low power. The thing about a 50 watt um, radio is that you could lower the power if needed. I mean, if you're running a gasoline engine car or a diesel engine car, you're, you know, the, the, the excess power from the alternator will easily power that. If you're like me running an electric car, um, you know, the DC to DC converter will easily power that. Or you can run a separate battery. Make sure you wire it properly, and make sure you wire it with, um, you know, a proper fuse, at, especially at the positive lead. The negative lead, there's a little bit of controversy, but that, that you don't really fuse the negative lead. But um, as far as brands and radios, I mean, you know, it's up to you. Icom, Yesu, Kenwood make a lot of them. Uh, Alinko also makes a lot of them. Um, I would really get one with a de detachable head that you can put the radio below the seat or in the trunk or behind the seat in the case of a truck and just, um, you know, you uh, you have that there. HF radios, well, you know, Icom and, and uh, Yesu make some good ones. Um, the I really recommend 100-watt radios for those. Okay, next question. Using an old TV mask for ham antennas. Well, you know, that's kind of a pickle because there are two things. Let's say, you know, some, the question was, I just bought a house and it came with a tower and a TV antenna on top. Can I use a TV antenna and tower for ham radio? Yes and no. So the TV antenna, you probably can't use that for ham radio. What you can do is you can take down the TV antenna and probably use the aluminum to make uh, like a VHF, UHF antenna. But to be honest, at that point, you know, I would look for a dedicated VHF, UHF antenna. You scout the ham fest. There's so many people selling selling them. I mean, I picked up some I have in the barn that I need to put up. You know, it's not, um, it's there's not in short supply, okay? You check swap.qth.com. You check the QRZ and eHAM classified. You will see a lot of them. The tower itself, I would caution putting any big antennas on top of the TV tower and also inspect the condition of the tower because a lot of those towers might be rusted. They might not have a proper foundation. If they're house bracketed, the brackets might have come loose. Watch your safety first. And if you're putting up an antenna, I would really recommend a light duty antenna like a hex beam or something like that or a small VHF UHF beam. So. Cannot make local contacts on 80 meters using an antenna that works great for DX. Well, the answer to that is simple. Your antenna is too high. Okay. If you want to do local contacts, you're probably looking at something called ENVIS, Near Vertical Incident Skywave. I could probably do a whole show on that, but basically you want an antenna that's lower to the ground, probably 20, 25 feet, not much higher than that on 80 meters, 
maybe even lower. What happens is the signal actually would bounce off the ground and then go straight up into the sky, right? Where it would scatter around. You know, you call that a cloud warmer, right? Well, it's a colloquial term for it. But it is a near vertical incidence sky wave, right? For DX, you want the angle of radiation to be low. For local, you want it to be high. You know what? Maybe we'll talk about it. Let me know at ria at n2rj.com. All right, that's Q&A. Let's see what's next coming up. Okay, let's go to a question from the general class pool. Uh, G1A01, on which MFHF bands is a general class license holder granted all amateur f radio frequency privileges? A, 60 meters, 20 meters, 17 meters, and 12 meters. Not really, because uh, the generals don't get access to all of 20 meters and 60 meters. Well, they do get 60 meters. They don't get access to all of 20 meters. B, 160 meters, 80 meters, 40 meters, and 10 meters. No, because they don't get access to all of 80 meters and 40 meters. C, 160 meters, 60 meters, 30 meters, 17 meters, 12 meters, and 10 meters. Um, yes, that's it, because the walk bands, which is 30, 17, and 12, plus 160 and 60, and also 10 meters, generals do have full access. So the easiest way to remember it is the generals have full access to all of the work bands, which are 30, 17, and 12. They also have full access to 160 and 10. The only restricted bands really are 80, 40, 15, and 20. Okay? So easy to remember. Back to show. All righty. Well, let me tell you. My absolute favorite ham fest, at least here in the U.S., is the Dayton Hamvention because it's the biggest and the baddest and the most original. Well, it's not the most original. They're they're like the OG, I guess. You know, they're they're the ones that that are really they're the ones that kind of like characterize the big ham fest. And I remember seeing in magazines where they had like helicopters back then, and didn't really have drones, showing pictures of. Dayton Hamvention with lots of people out in the parking lot and out in the boneyard. Yeah, the boneyard where you could get, that's a flea market, by the way, where you could get all sorts of junk. I mean, sorry, um, things for your station. <laughs> all sorts of stuff. It's going to be really cool. I love walking through. I bought a few things. I bought not only amateur radio gear, but also antique radios because I love to collect antique radios, particularly zenith transoceanic shortwave which i do actually use to listen to wtww from time to time you know so it's always good yeah you know um i'll probably tell um ted and Hol ted and holly will probably get a good kick out out of that so the first one as i mentioned the awrl will host enforcement bureau's lark hadley ka4a so the FCC Enforcement Bureau Regional Director, Lark Hadley, KA4A, will participate in an AWRL-sponsored forum at Dayton Hamvention on Saturday, May 21, right? And the forum is called Good Operators in the AWRL VM Program, which will be led by Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH. Riley's a really great guy. I mean, you know, some people, well, obviously, if you, if you violate amateur rules, you're probably not going to like him. But I'll tell you. He is a good down-to-earth ham. He loves what he does in making ham radio a friendly place for people. And you know what? He's really, you know, he loves to see people work together. I, I always correspond with him, and I always try to get pick his brain on different enforcement matters and such like that. But um, back to Lark Hadley. He's responsible for the FCC field offices in Region 3, which is basically most of the western United States. And um, Riley, he was retired from the from Spectra Enforcement. He actually heads up the AWRL Volunteer Monitoring Program now, which is a program that monitors the airwaves and sends out you know notices to hams through the AWRL of not only if you've been naughty but also if you've been nice. So if you've been a good operator. Believe it or not, Riley might just send you a card. Hey, can't beat that with a stick, okay? Well, that's, I don't think it's right. I think it's an AWRL staff person that sends them out, but, you know, they, they coordinate all this electronic database. 
Of course, the real big offenders, you know, the guys who basically want to pull the tiger's tail, they get um, referred to the FCC for follow-up action. Uh, you know, I, I don't like to concentrate on those things, but, you know, I really enjoy when people are do good things on the airwaves. So, you know, um, be kind, please rewind. Okay. So, yeah, so they're going to be talking. That's going to be pretty exciting. But, you know, Dayton's not only about those forums. I mean, you know, there are a lot of vendors. Um, I believe Ted Randall and Holly are going to be there for WTWW. I'll probably hang out a little bit with them. I'm going to be hanging out at the AWRL development booth, um, talking about fundraising and scholarships and also grants. We, we have this new club grant program going on. And um, But the real fun for me at Dayton, not only is the friends, okay, it's the after hours events, right? And this year I'm doing three after hours events. So the first one that I have to absolutely do is the AWRL donor event. And the AWRL donor event is where we recognize those who have been especially generous to the AWRL. And you know, we have to recognize those folks because they they sacrifice some of their, you know, their fortunes, and we're blessed to have them help out the AWRL. I always like to get what's going on in their mind because they they're invested a significant amount of money and also, you know, because they believe in the mission. And that's good. Um, the other event I'm going to, Fridays are usually kind of interesting for me because previously, Fridays I used to go to DX dinner. And then Fridays now I'm actually going to the Flex Radio Forum. Flex used to have their, Flex used to have their, their banquet, their dinner on Thursday nights, okay? Um, was it Thursday or Fridays? Probably, but um, they split it up in two, and Thursday they have for the contest and DX crowd, and then Fridays they have for general audiences. And I used to go to the contest and DX ones, which is where they gave, they gave me three awards, actually. It was really nice to be awarded and recognized by Flex. But um, I, I will be going to the Friday one now, you know, just because I, I want to hang out with the Flex folks. We'll see how that goes. Fridays, I used to go to DX dinner. You know, and DX dinner is really interesting because there they talk about DXing and DXpeditions. I love I love to work DX. I always love working new countries. I'll always love talking to people in new countries and getting them in the log, you know. You know, my friend, you know, this is one bittersweet thing about my friends in Ukraine is that um, I can't talk to them except for one person which is going to be operating on Mother's Day for uh, from EA4 from Spain. So I hope to make contact with him. But, um, yeah, I have Ukraine confirmed on every band except 12 and 6 meters. So hopefully they can get back on the air when they, they, when they take back their country, so to speak, from the aggressors. But, um, yeah, it's, um, it's really, you know, DX dinner used to be really nice. They give out a lot of prizes and such. Now I'm going to substitute out with Flex Dinner. Saturday night, I'm actually going to be going to Contest Dinner. And that, for me, is the highlight of the whole thing. Because Contest Dinner has a whole bunch of... They, they have interesting speakers, right? But they have a whole bunch of prizes. And, you know... Uh, let's face it, okay, nobody goes to these events for the food, okay, the food is okay, okay, it's, um, you know, it's okay, right, but nobody goes to these for the food, they go to this for the friends, for the camaraderie, and they go to it for, you know, to meet up and rub elbows, I usually go on a table with some of my um, club members from the Frankfurt Radio Club, one of the best things you can ever do, by the way, if you're interested in contesting, is join a contest club. They're very, very invested in making high scores, and they will ensure that you do too. So those are my after hours events. There's a few other things. Um, K9PG sometimes organizes a dinner at Hooters. I think that's either on Thursday or Friday. <laughs> that's hilarious as heck. So you know, it's like, oh. Uh, um, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty hilarious. You guys, like, you know, it's funny. They, um, what else? Um, they're, Scott Wright is organizing a uh, dinner. 
he is a former editor of MCJ, Dr. Scott Wright, and he's also a renowned physician. I believe either at uh, Mayo, I believe he's Mayo Clinic, or either Cleveland Clinic or Mayo Clinic. But he is um, he is a renowned physician, and he's done work with um, with the coronavirus as well. He is having, and he's a ham. He's having a dinner to celebrate 50 years in amateur radio. Can you believe that? And, you know, Scott Scott and I have always talked about various ideas and how to grow amateur radio, you know. And I really um, appreciate all his advice. So he's doing that. That one's by invitation only. I got invited. Unfortunately, I have to, you know, I definitely have to, to um, hang out at the ARRL donor reception, which is no problem, you know, because, um, you know, uh, there are things you just have to do. So at Dayton, what else do I do? Well, apart from the flea market, I enjoy watching the vendors. I don't usually buy much. Um, sometimes I might buy something, but, you know, I don't go there prepared to spend a lot of money. Uh, I, the lone exception was in 2006 when I bought a complete mobile station. So, all right, so that's a Dayton thing. I hope to see you at Dayton, okay? That's um, not this, this week, but next week, okay? The next um, week. All right, we'll be right back. So one thing I forgot to mention about Dayton before I go into the six meter topic is my friend Karsten, uh, DM9 Echo Echo, and Karsten, uh, oh my gosh, he has been doing so much. He he drove to the Polish Ukraine border. He lives in Germany and he owns a hotel, and he not only um, sent supplies for Ukrainians, but he also took Ukrainian refugees into his hotel. Yeah, he has a hotel. And he actually took um, Ukrainian refugees in. The guy has a really big heart. Um, you know, God bless him for what he's doing. I, I really hope that um, he continues to do it. So let's talk about six. He's coming to Dayton, by the way. He booked his flights. So let's talk about six meters. Six meters. So as I mentioned, six meters is a very technician-friendly band. It's known as the magic band because it just opens up at a moment's notice. But it's fairly predictable when with time of year it'll open up okay and once it opens up you have possibilities of dx from anywhere to within from within a few hundred miles to straight across the world the e layer is the star to show here so the e layer is a layer of of the atmosphere um, the ionosphere actually which is the upper layers of the atmosphere which has charged particles and gas that is at the bottom. So you have the, in the ionosphere, you have D layer, you have the E layer, then you have the F layer. And at daytime, the F layer separates in two, so you have F1 and F2. F1 and F2, and of course at night, F1 and F2 condense back down. They, it stratifies during the day and, and then it condenses back down. What happens is that the F1 and F2 layer is responsible for most of the propagation on the lower bands you know, like the 40, 20, 15, uh, 10 meters. But the D layer kind of absorbs, you know, a lot of the waves. So it it will reduce propagation at times, at various times of the day. Um, the E layer is interesting because there isn't really a firm theory on why the E layer does this, but the E layer of the atmosphere will become intensively charged in spots, right? And these are like called clouds because they, you know, they gather up in certain areas. And these clouds will allow, will refract the radio waves down from your location to somewhere far off. And um, some people believe it could probably be due to, I don't know, um, the solar winds, um, the wind shear, causing a lot of ionization to be concentrated in certain areas. Uh, we don't know exactly why. It could be as the Earth is tilt is facing more toward the sun, it'll probably get more of a hit that way because um, it does seem to coincide with the tilt in the Earth. But um, the bottom line is that 6 meters is open for DX quite a lot. Okay, And in the... Northern Hemisphere, so this includes the United States, continental Europe, and, um, you know, that part of the world. 
and Asia, a lot of Asia, you will find that the northern hemisphere will have six meters open from about April to May, um, April, May to about September, with the peaks happening in June, in late May and early June. Um, July around there is when it really gets hot. And then you have a smaller peak around December, January, around that time frame. In the southern hemisphere, things are reversed. So places like Australia, New Zealand, South America, they see different things. But they actually, you can actually sometimes even see early in the season, it's more favorable for what we call trans-equatorial propagation, where we have the northern and southern hemispheres, where you're able to make contacts between the northern and southern hemispheres quite easily. Now, six meters is interesting because some years ago, it used to only be that you had Morse code, right, CW. You had voice, single sideband. And a lot of people made contacts that way. Then along came Joe Taylor and FT8. Okay, so my friend Joe Taylor, K1JT, he made a software package called WSJTX. This really wasn't much of a big deal for six meter operators until, until we had the advent of FT8 in 2017. Now FT8 basically is a very weak signal mode that allows you to decode and make contacts, to make contacts with very weak signals, some that you are barely on the threshold of being able to hear. And for this reason, it's become very controversial among some people. Some people say that how, well, you know, I can't hear those signals with my ears. It's not real radio. I mean, I don't agree with them, but, you know, these are the viewpoints that are out there. But FT8 has really taken off in terms of giving people the opportunity to work DX, you know, make contacts on six meters when normally otherwise they would not have been to. You know, there was a, a group called EME Rovers. I believe their call sign was N4EME or something like that. What they used to do is they used to have automated FT8 beacons, just occasionally throw out a call and um, then come back to see what, um, you know, what, uh, what would come back. So, um, yeah, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of what they would, um, they would use. But six meters has been perfect for FT8. The only problem is now that a lot of people saying, well, you know, you killed off all the other modes. That can be true to an extent. I try to make contacts when their band is open on Morse code and single sideband. You more find those during contests, right? Like during a contest, you'll find opportunities to make contacts on single sideband and also Morse code. The ARRL has actually also recently adjusted the rules of its VHF contest to encourage more non-FT8 activity. And this is a good thing because, you know, you can actually encourage people to diversify their modes and maybe find something they'd like. Okay? Of course, if you want to operate FT8, that's your prerogative. Nothing's going to stop you. With that, you know, Whatever you do on the band, you know, is really up to you. As far as my activities, I'm up to like 60, I think 67 countries on six. I'm working toward DXCC. That'll be band number 10. And, you know, it's been pretty interesting. So I'm looking forward to June, July, when I can basically capture a whole bunch of other countries, work a lot more countries, and hopefully get to that magic number of 100, where I'll have 10 bands of DXCC. I'm looking at my wall. I see I have a plaque here. The five band DXCC number 8894 and 2RJ October 9, 2017. And I have 30, 17, 12, and 160. I'm missing six and two. Six will come with the sporadic E propagation, and two will come with moon bounce. So this is one of the ways, you know, to do six meter awards and DX. Now the uh, DXCC is not only the, the award, of course, the only award. You can do worked all states. So you can try to work all 50 states on six meters. Loads of fun. 
you can try to do grid squares. So primarily people chase grid squares on six and they go for an award called VUCC or VHF UHF Century Club, which is where you are trying to work 100 grids. Okay. And that is, um, that's a very, very interesting activity because there are two things on that. You either work your way up to how many grids and you get different endorsement stickers on your VUCC certificate, but there's one specific award that people aim to get on six. And that is the Fred Fish Memorial Award. So there was a person by the name of Fred Fish, right? And, um, it's also called the FFMA, um, and you can hear me click in here. I'm going to bring up the, um, I just want to be sure about how we do this here. So the FFMA Fred Fish Memorial Award was created in honor of Fred Fish W5FF. He's a silent key. He was the first, the first amateur to have worked all confirmed 488 maidenhead grid squares in the 48 contiguous United States on six meters. Okay, so anybody who duplicates that achievement will definitely um, you know, receive that award. There are how many of them? Uh, you know, there... <laughs> oh, boy. There's... Um, they have them listed here on the AWRL website. They have um, 21, 22. How many people? I don't think it's really all that many. You know, um, the FFMA leaderboard. They have, um, yeah. Let's see here. Oh, they also have they they also have a number of needed grids. Um, yeah, that people need to work and such like that. But you know, it's a worthy endeavor. But the thing is, you cannot. Oh, here are the FFMA reserve prints. So number one, of course, is W5FF. You have W5OZI. Uh, then you have Rick Roderick, K5UR, is number three. I bet he was upset that he was number two. <laughs> Sorry, Rick. Okay. But, um, yeah, he was there. And now you have um, 23 of them. So 23 people have done FFMA from 2008 till 2021. You know, it's really hard because some grids are basically uninhabited and you have to do expeditions and some of them are on BLM land and such like that, you know. If you're wondering what grids were, grids are basically where you divide up the earth into into rectangles, right? And, you know, the, it's called the maidenhead system. So radio amateurs have a system of, um, of grid squares where I'm trying to find the exact... Um, the exact uh, dimension for a grid, okay? So the, it's a geographic coordinate system, which um, I'm trying to find it here. Yeah, anyway, so it's a geographic coordinate system where you have like, you know, two, four, six digits. Um, and it's a geographic coordinate system used by amateur radio operators to succinctly describe your location, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, here it is. Wikipedia to rescue. It is a geocode system used by amateur radio operators to succinctly describe geographic coordinates, which replace the deprecated Cougar RA locator. And, um, yeah, so basically, uh, you have something like my grid is FN 21, but then you can add on letters and numbers to, uh, get it, um, you know, to bring narrow to square down, right? And um, you have like um, you have uh, character pairs that include longitude and then latitude, and then it's base eighteen letters eight R second pair goes to base ten zero to nine third pair, then they go eight X and then fourth pair goes ten digits zero to nine, but um, yeah it's a recursive function you could go all the way down, you know. It's really interesting. So these are uh, two things I know of that basically uh, divide the globe into areas. One of them is the Maidenhead, and the other one is CQ zones. I mean, there are other things that radio amateurs use, but I think these two are pretty much exclusive. I mean, there's other things like parks on the air designations. But anyway, so this that that is one definitely, definitely huge thing that um, 
six meter award chasers use. Of course, as I mentioned, parks on the air. Parks on the air is a thing with six meters. They make contacts for parks on the air. Uh, field day, you know, field day is good for six meters because technicians could use field day, one, and two, field day is an additional band that you can use on field day. So I notice a lot of, I visit a lot of field day sites and I notice they have six meter beams because I mean, let's face it, you're in prime six meter season. So you want to be able to take advantage of that. Right. Uh, and in Europe, of course, in Europe, you have their field day as well. And you have um, other things. You also have summits on the air. I believe summits on the air started in the UK or Europe and then was exported to the United States. Um, so all of these things worked all Europe awards and all sorts of stuff, too. All right. So that is six meters, guys. I hope um, you enjoyed that, um, guys and gals. And uh, we'll talk about the next uh, thing and close up. So let's go to another general question. On which of the following bands is image transmission prohibited? This is G1A03. A, 160 meters. B, 30 meters. C, 20 meters. D, 12 meters. Well, 160 meters, not really. Image transmission is allowed in the form of slow scan TV. Uh, C, 20 meters. Yeah, I, I hear the single slow scan TV all the time, so it can't be that. 12 meters. Yeah, you hear slow scan TV. The answer is 30 meters, and the reason why is because 30 meters, you're only allowed Morse code and digital. Now, this might be a little confusing because some people think that single, uh, a slow scan TV is digital, but it's really not. It's analog. You can have digital slow scan, but you know you, most of it is analog, and the FCC classifies that as image communications anyway. So the answer is B, 30 meters. Let's go back to a technician. T1A03, what do the FCC rules state regarding the use of a phonetic alphabet for station identification in the amateur radio service? A, it is required when transmitting emergency messages. B, it is encouraged. C, it is required when in contact with foreign stations. D, all these choices are correct. Well, I could tell you that it is encouraged, right? Um, it's not required when in contact with foreign stations, although it might be helpful due to the language barrier because a lot of them don't, their English is not, you know, as good as a native speaker, although most of them understand English. Uh, it's required when transmitting emergency messages? Not really. No, as a matter of fact, a lot of times you'd be better off transmitting in plain English. So the answer is B, it is encouraged. Okay. All right, so the next question, how many operator primary station license grants may be held by any one person? A, one, B, no more than two, C, one for each band on which a person plans to operate, it, operate. D, one for each permanent station location from the, which the person plans to operate. Well, no more than two, mm, you might have multiple personality disorder, but no. Um, C, one for each band on which a person plans to operate? No, because the license is for the operator. Yeah? D, one for each permanent station location from which a person plans to operate? No, not really. And to tell you the truth, the FCC only really gives you one station license per uh, call sign. So, you know, you can have multiple locations under one station license. If you have a club, you have an additional station license. So the answer is one per person. Okay? One. One. Let's go back to the general pool. Which of the following frequencies is within the general class portion of the 75 meter phone band? A, 1875 kilohertz. That's right out because that's on 160 meters. B, 3750 kilohertz. Maybe not because that's in the, ex in the extra portion. Uh, D, 4005 kilohertz. Well, if you're a shortwave broadcast station, yeah, but no, no amateur stations allowed. About four megahertz. So the answer is C, 3900 kilohertz. The general class portion goes from 3.8 to 4 megahertz, or 3800 to 3900 megahertz, right? Uh, G, G1A07, which of the following frequencies is within the general class portion of the 20 meter phone band? Okay, so A, 14005 kilohertz. Nope, that's CW portion. B, 14105 kilohertz. Uh, no, because that's still within the CW slash data portion. C, 14305 kilohertz. 
Yes, because that is the phone portion, which is 14,225 to 14,350. D, 14,405 kilohertz. No, that's out of band. You'll probably get a pink card from the ARRL VM program, which we talked about earlier. Okay, if you want to learn more about these uh, technician and general questions, let me know. Drop me a line at ria at n2rj.com. If you have any particular exam difficulties, let me know, and we'll talk about them on the air. Back to the show. All right, well, you know, it's been another fun week. This is show number three. Um, WTWW has moved the show from its old time slot into prime time, uh, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern, which means that the show must be either doing good or <laughs> it must be doing horrible. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Ted Randall actually told me that how the show has been getting a lot of good compliments, and I really thank you guys for doing that because, you know, uh, it matters to me that you enjoy the show. Of course, if you do have topics for the show, you can send them to Ria at n2rj.com. If you would like a QSL card, you can get one from the station, by the way. Uh, you, they have a way to QSL. If you want to QSL me, you can send your request, your reception report, to P.O. Box 73, Sussex, New Jersey, 07461. That's P.O. Box 73, Sussex, that's S-U-S-S-E-X, New Jersey, 07461, USA. A self-addressed stamped envelope is appreciated but not required. I will send out your, if you send out one, stating that you heard the show on WTWW Shortwave, I can send you a card back and it says Shortwave Listener on it, right? And uh, you can add that to your collection if you're a Shortwave Listener. Of course, if you do hear me on the amateur bands, you're more than welcome to send a card too. If you make contact on the amateur bands, hey, you know what? That's great. I, I will definitely QSL if you let me know if you want a QSL. What else? Final thoughts. Final thoughts closing argument here. So, look, um, the world is opening back up, okay? And HamFast and Ham, you know, HamVention is going back on. I really hope that, um, you know, we can get more out and about and see more things, do more things. But at the same time, you know, we realize there's a lot going on in the world. And radio keeps us together. Radio will always help bridge barriers and you know, break down walls, so to speak. As hard as some people try, they can't suppress the power of radio. We are here every Saturday at 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern on WTWW Shortwave, also 000 UTC, of course, that's Sunday on the Shortwave station. You can listen live at WTWW.us. I do put the show on the YouTube channel at Ria Shack Ham Radio. And one word about that, yes, there are adver ad advertisements on the YouTube channel. Unfortunately, I cannot do anything about that. Even if I took off the ads from my end, YouTube just puts their own ads and they take all the money. So, you know, it's better I put the ads and then I could at least control a little bit. They would probably put a lot more than what I did. Um, the show on WTWW is always ad-free and it will remain so as long as I can, okay? I'd like to thank, thank uh, Ted Randall and Holly again for the use of their fine shortwave station. Please be sure to go to WTWW.us and see how you can support them, and uh, I'm sure they'd appreciate it. And, of course, what can I say to our friends in Ukraine and across the world? This is Ria, N2RJ, saying... Best DX, peace, and 73s.